Thank you very much. Thank you to the stage for letting me come and talk. And uh, this is something which uh, bears importance for all of us. I do work with industry, uh, but nothing that really relates to this topic. Uh, we care about leaks. Leaks are bad. Uh, why are leaks bad? Morbidity mortality is discussed. I think this one really needs to be pinpointed, is that worse oncological outcomes for rectal cancer, uh, delaying uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, really solid data that a leak affects outcome to the patient, and never mind what it costs to our society and to the patient itself. Um, here's your conclusion. Condition of the bowel, abdomen, and patient, all three have to be favorable uh, to do an anastomosis. The bowel, well perfused. Is there poop? Uh, and how is your patient? Realize also that diversion does not always prevent <coughs> leak. It can mitigate uh, the leak. In this uh, meta-analysis of five trials, uh, 880 patients, diverted patient leak rate was 5.6, undiverted 16%, uh, but it does um, uh, minimize the rate of leakage and reoperation related to leakage. So diversion can be uh, a friend. So what about the bowel? I think we've heard about this perfusion. Here's a case I'll show you that uh, I had uh, where I was concerned about the bowel. This is an anterior resection. It looked a little purplish, so what did I do? I'm like Morris, I love losing the scope on every anastomosis. I didn't in inject anything, I just took four sips and I plucked the mucosa. Does it bleed? I don't know, let's see. Here we come back in. Yep, bleeding, red, pulsatile. I left it alone, it was fine. So I think we evaluate and I think there's nothing like looking at your anastomosis to evaluate it at the time to decide, are you okay? There are other factors that uh, obviously make us concerned. Thickened bowel, obstructed bowel, radiated bowel, and bowel preps. Where are we with bowel preps? It's bell bottoms, baby. You know, what comes around goes around. We're back to mechanical lavage and oral antibiotics, and I think uh, if you talk to John Alverde, he'll tell you the antibiotics may help reduce some of the, the virulent strains that we deal with. So the factors uh, that are important uh, bowel preps, yes, and we're back in. And so uh, that's what we're doing. The abdomen. Uh, so I, I think about all these when I'm doing an anastomosis, the bowel, the abdomen, and the patient. And the abdomen is kind of the easy one. Uh, what's it like inside? Well, I think in trauma, where the, the contamination is acute, you know, anastomosis, primary anastomosis can be safe. But that's not what we as colorectal surgeons generally deal with. Most of the time, it's a, a chronically contaminated abdomen and looking at Crohn's and diverticulitis and what do I think about in those areas. Well, looking at patients who have an uh, abscess of perforation in ileocolic resection in this study, uh, intra-abdominal sepsis, uh, it was worse as a risk factor for anastomotic and uh, intra-abdominal complications. And in the meta-analysis also, uh, worse complications in patients with Crohn's, with abscess or perforation, who you perform a unprotected anastomosis. Um, diverticulitis. I think it's, there are so many studies, you can get whatever answer you want. Um, many non-randomized studies looking at primary anastomosis versus not. Uh, there are two prospective randomized studies, uh, and as we heard from Bashir, these studies were stopped. Uh, 34 uh, primary anastomosis versus 54 Hartmann's. It was stopped because it was planned for 600 and they could in a crew. And sort of shame on us as surgeons for not uh, getting done what we need to get done. The second trial showed no difference, uh, 32 versus 30 patients. But the complication rate in both groups is 80%. I mean, no difference, but complication rate that I would say is a little bit high uh, for my liking. Uh, so I think in diverticulitis, it is, as many areas, judgment. You know, what, it, what is the contamination affecting my patient and how will it affect my anastomosis? In looking at this meta-analysis, uh, 14 studies, Marked heterogeneity limited the possibility to summarize in a meta-analytical method. In other words, the data is all over the place and we can't tell. And I think right now, that's how I am. Every time I go into a case, oh, it's it's diverticulitis, it's a, it's a Hinchy 3, it's safe. But when you're in that OR with that patient, there are factors. The, the patient may be septic or not septic, and I can't really determine at that time uh, which one's going to be until I get there. But when I'm on the table, the patient's tachycardic on presser, I'm going to think strongly about diversion with or without an anastomosis. So finally, the, the factors that affect this is our patient. Um, many studies looking at this, ASA score, nutrition, smoking, and obesity. 
Can you give me a reason why uh, health insurance is so high? I mean, this is what we're seeing everywhere. The people say, oh, you're in Boston, they're all skinny. Oh, you're, you're from America, they're, they're, they're all skinny. I mean, across the world, obesity is a huge problem, and more and more we're asked to do things uh, that we're not comfortable with, and that's a, a, a big factor. When the Michigan Surgical Quality uh, Collaborative Group looked at 9,200 colorectal resections, meaning a minimum colon, 2.7 uh, leak rate, and when they looked at factors in the first column, uh, diverted or non-diverted, the factors that were important, male sex, BMI greater than 30, chronic immunosuppression, surgical time, urgent or emergent surgery, and tobacco use, smoking. Uh, looking at uh, cases for rectal cancer, I just picked this because it was one of the most recent studies looking at TATME as a technique, but also looking at the risk factors for leak. 1,600 cases in the registry, which is great because it was, they're all recent, 30-month period, 107 centers, 29 countries, so really a broad view across low pelvic anastomoses. 66 stapled, 88% diverted, the majority of us diverting our low pelvic anastomoses, which I am a fan of. Leak rate, as we've talked about, 15%. But the factors, male sex, obesity, smoking, diabetes, tumor size, uh, blood loss, hands-on anastomosis, and prolonged perineal operative time. These are the factors that I think. So when I get a long case with, uh, with a lot of blood loss, I'm thinking more about diversion. I think what's important, though, is that diversion may, may affect when we see leaks. You know, my le the leak rate is only 5%. That's at 30 days, because that's where most studies say that's what it is. But when we looked at 245 colorectal anastomosis at Leahy, the majority of the leaks were found after 30 days because the patient's diverted. You're not studying it till later. Uh, and I think uh, one of the sad things is, is that 25% of the delayed leaks weren't found until after we closed the stoma. In other words, you looked, you did your water soluble, and yet there were leaks occurring after that. And that's probably the worst scenario that you don't want to be in, but it still happens. So diversion doesn't mean it will prevent leak, and if you divert and then undivert, the leak may be found afterwards. All right, so what do we do to prevent, uh, yeah, tell Santa don't smoke? I think when I ask the panel, when do you tell them to stop? Because I think there's some controversy. Uh, we try to um, do prehabilitation. Does that really help in preventing a leak? I'm not really sure, but it's probably good. And we're back to the bell bottoms where we are doing bowel preps. Pathology, um, factors, looking at IBD and looking at cancer. Uh, uh, I think we've already talked a bit about the cancer, so let's talk about the IBD. Ulcerative colitis and the use of biologics because it's really the, the question. Is it safe to do a, a pouch uh, on somebody? And never mind divert it or not, just, just even doing the pouch itself. Uh, early study from Cleveland Clinic, when, when Remicade first came out, 46 patients uh, out of 523 undergoing elective uh, pouch surgery. The use of uh, Remicade was associated with higher early complications, septic complications, and late complications. And so now sort of thinking, do we go back uh, to this? And this was a study looking at uh, the NIS database, looking at procedures in the left column, just looking at whether patients uh, had, as their initial operation for colitis, a proctor colectomy and reconstruction or a total abdominal colectomy. And when 2005 came, uh, it changed. Uh, and we started to flip back to doing more total colectomies. In three stage versus two, it's flipped. So now I think uh, the use of biologics has changed a lot of our thoughts and practice for UC. And the CCFA put together this position paper saying that for CUC, NTT and F antibody therapy may increase post complications. And of course, the decision to perform is left at surgeon discretion. Um, not good evidence, but I think all of us are concerned when considering doing uh, even just an operation for pouch surgery. Um, Crohn's disease, two things to think about when they're on biologics and whether it's primary or recurrent, which may or may not think about. The use of biologics, uh, this first study, uh, biologics was associated with uh, worse outcome, but in a meta-analysis, uh, it crossed the line and it wasn't worse. Um, so uh, I think it's kind of left to you at the time. I look at that as one of my factors when I'm in the operating room. If, if the patient's on biologic and there's anything else bad, I use that as my deciding factor to whether I divert or not. And this was kind of a shocking study that we put together, but I think most of us would realize it's probably true. When we looked at 206 patients with Crohn's, when we looked at leaks, we had 20 leaks, 10%. If it was a primary resection, 5%. If it was a first time redo, 13%. And patients with redo, 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 
had the highest leak rate. And so now I think a lot more when I have doing my third time ileocolic resection on somebody on a biologic, whether I'm going to divert that patient. And finally, uh, we've talked about it a lot, the intestinal biome. Uh, I love the bottom line, support uh, bacteria. It's the only culture some people have. Uh, and I think John's doing a lot more work. And we may be screening our patients. We may be getting stool samples before we operate to decide about whether we divert or not. We're not there yet, but there's, you're going to hear more about it as time goes on. The final variables uh, that we really look at are surgical factors, blood loss, operative time, and the surgeon factors. This was a great study coming back from 1980, multi-center trial, 28 consulting surgeons, 1,500 cases, and the leak rate went in from anywhere from 0.5 to 35%. And the number of surgeons in each of the categories was variable. So how do we improve as surgeons? Well, what do I turn to? I'm from Boston, I turn to the Patriots. Belichick says, continuous improvement to reach perfection is a relentless goal, and this unites them. And when somebody does something wrong, uh, Belichick makes everybody do more. And so you do it as a team effort. So we did that at Leahy, uh, where we gave biannual feedback to the surgeons looking at their leak rates. And we looked uh, at 100% capture of our patients in leaks. And uh, Rocco came to us twice a year and would tell us what, what would happen. And when we looked at different time periods from 2008 to 2013, uh, the case mix changed a little bit, doing less hand, uh, still doing a fair bit of laparoscopy. The leak rate dropped from 5.2 to 2.9. When we look at individual surgeons, surgeons' leak rates dropped. I think, is it a Hawthorne effect or whether you're just getting data and talking to your colleagues and figuring out what you're doing? There is significant variability, uh, which usually means that things are preventable. It's hard to pick point which one is the most preventable. I think for me, the answer is uh, leak testing. We've written about this a number of times. I think it's uh, all here. And the only point I want to make here is that if you look at an air leak testing, if it's airtight on the left side at anastomosis, the leak rate is 3.8%. If it has an air leak, the leak rate was 8%. If you don't test an anastomosis, it's 8%. A circular stapled anastomosis, if it's airtight, 3.6. If it has an air leak and you do something, 4.8. If you don't test a circular anastomosis, the leak rate is 21%. There was a paper yesterday uh, presented 800 cases, same thing. You got to test your left side of the anastomosis. What do you do about it? We used to just suture it and say it'll be okay, and then we looked at the data and we found if we just sutured versus redoing it or diverting the patient, the leak rate was surprisingly high. Uh, and in this study, it was not designed to answer this question, so we continue to look at this question in terms of donut status, uh, how big was the leak, how many sutures were used, were they reinforced before or afterwards? Were they all retested? I can tell you they were all retested in our study. And we've looked at this again now with 119 intraoperative air leaks. Uh, and what we find uh, is here, it, we can't say that it's not non-inferior, 9% uh, versus uh, zero, but it's getting close. So pretty much air leak testing is probably mandatory. And I agree with Morris. I test everything uh, that I can. Because when it really comes down to the end of it, it's this, the calculated risk. We, the surgeons, make all the calculations. The patient takes all the risk. So do no harm. For me, take in consideration the condition of the bowel, the abdomen of the patient before you do an anastomosis and whether you're going to divert or not. And for me, all three have to be favorable, and you have to have a negative air leak test for me to leave the OR without a diversion. Thanks very much.